Um, good evening, everyone. Thank you all so much uh, for joining us this evening. Uh, I'd like to start by welcoming you all to this distinguished evening uh, for us, especially that it is uh, a soft launch of sorts to our Val Palestine Land Studies Center, which is recently founded at AUB with this landmark lecture by Dr. Salman Abu Sitta. Um, seeing the numbers and the profiles of all the attendees, I'm not sure I need to do a, a, an introduction, but I will, um, because this is really a serious honor for me to um, be with all of you today and introduce uh, my uh, new hero, <laughs> Dr. Abs Salman Abu Sitta, uh, from this platform today at AUB. He is, of course, the founder and president of Palestine Land Societies, but to you, to many of you, he's known as a scholar and an activist whose work on Palestine and the right of return has inspired many and enlightened generations. He is the author of numerous books and publications. I will mention the two landmark publications that I've been busy reading lately, The Atlas of Palestine, which was recently reissued and mapping of my mapping my return. I want to take this opportunity really uh, to leave the floor to um, our precious speaker, but I want to extend my sincere thank you uh, to Abu Sitta really on this very, very special occasion and um, thank him on behalf of the AUB community, AUB president and provost, former and current provost who's helped found the center only because of his very, very generous uh, donation and gesture to choose AUB as home for his fabulous and unique and amazing collection of books and maps. Uh, I also take this opportunity to announce that AUB has founded and established the Palestine Land Studies Center for many of you who may not know that already to host and activate this collection. And I'm uh, especially honored to have been part of this uh, process and to be the custodian of um, the, the very exciting uh, endeavor to establish the center at AUB, to host the collection, and to really, really reach the dream of Dr. Abusita together to create a hub of research and academic activities, not just to have an archival material here hosted at AUB. So I'm looking forward to um, launching this journey today, all of us together as a community and friends and partners that we will reach out to and donors, of course, to make this the beginning of a, a fantastic trajectory and journey of making Palestine the center of our issues and occupation where it truly deserves. With that, I open uh, the floor to Dr. Abu Sitta, who will lecture to us about restoring Palestine what a worthy and appropriate title for our launching of the lecture series. And hopefully I'll reach out to you later with the launching of our website and many other activities. And I hope you all join us again and again. Thank you, Dr. Abu Sitta, for being here. Thank you for your generosity. And uh, I've been lucky to have become your friend over the past year. And I give you the floor and I thank everyone who's with us tonight. Father. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Huede. Professor Huede, we are fortunate, really, to have you as the founding director of Palestine Land Studies Center, PLSC. And I hope, and I'm sure, but I hope also, under your directorship, PLSC will be the hub of dynamic, powerful, and effective scholarship about the land and people of Palestine and will be a shining light in the imposed darkness about Palestine just cause. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Waida. And I will be very glad to cooperate with you uh, in the near future, now and the future. Now about our subject. Historically, Palestine has been and still is the subject of the world attention. Many foreign invaders came and left, the Romans, the Greeks, and the Crusaders. The people of the land remained essentially the same. 
Some may have changed their religion and language, but they maintain their bond to the land, immortalized in their worship places, shrines, and sacred land features. Invaders left few traces of their presence. The people of the land absorbed them, and they remained entrenched in the land. There are few countries in the world today which have been subject to so many invasions. They were all gone, except for now the Zionist invasion. That's because we have not yet seen the coming end of this violent history. But, like all unnatural events, epidemics, and historical aberrations, it will no doubt vanish. With this long trail of invaders, Palestinians became the most well-documented country in the world. It surpasses many capitals of Europe. Unlike other histories, Palestine was inflicted with the largest and longest campaign of misinformation, forgery, and deception. This forgery and deception are still going on today, only with more sophisticated but spurious scholarship and shady ideology assisted by well-oiled lobby campaigns. Palestine is the homeland of Jesus Christ. On its soil he walked. In its villages he dwelt. Because of him, Palestine was immortalized as the Holy Land. This is how it's shown on the Roman history. With the departure of the Romans, Byzantine Christian Palestine recorded the early history of Christianity. We are indebted to a Palestinian bishop, known by his Hellenistic name, Eusebius of Caesarea Palestina. He was baptized and ordained at Caesarea about 313 AD. He is credited with writing an account of the first centuries of Christianity. His most important work, used in our study today, is the Onomasticon. It was compiled as a directory of place names or gazetteer for pilgrims traveling to Jerusalem. It also provided historical geographers with a contemporary knowledge of the first, fourth century Palestine. His text was converted into maps, like this one. We made a full study of the bishop's work by comparison of names in his book with our modern atlas of Palestine. We identified at least 139 village names and 50 place names known to us today. Here in this map are their Byzantine names with phonetically similar modern names in the same locations and these same names and locations existed for 17 centuries. As I said, the heritage of Byzantine Christian Palestine does not end with books. It is ingrained in the popular daily practice and worship. We have recorded in our modern atlas about 4,300 historical and religious sites. And when people became Muslims, they converted many of these sites to shrines or maqams, but they kept reverence to the same places of worship. I have personal experience of this. In my village land, Al Ma'in, we have a maqam known as Sheikh Nuran, where women went to seek blessing. In 1995, I visited there and found that the Israelis demolished part of it. But I saw through the broken window a Byzantine cross, a Byzantine cross. Research led me to find that this site was the monastery of St. Hilarion, a Palestinian monk of the 4th century. 300 years later, 
In the spring of 637, Khalifa Umar bin Khattab arrived in Jerusalem and delivered the famous pact known as Al-Uhd al umariyya to its patriarch Sophronius. It was not a strange encounter. They had been neighbors and they had been frequent trading partners. With the spread of Islam, most Palestinians became Muslims, but they never let go of their land-related places of reverence. From 637 to 1917, that is 14, 13 centuries, Palestine was ruled by Muslim rulers, with the exception of the brief Crusaders period. As this map shows, in 1517, Palestine came under the Ottoman Muslim rule. In their rule of 400 years, they left us a well-documented legacy of land records, of laws, habits and customs, and remarkable beautiful architecture, especially in 250 buildings in Jerusalem. Of these records, we have the Daftari Mufassal, the Ottoman tax register for the year 1596. This Daftar or register lists all villages in Greater Syria, which is today Syria, Lebanon, Palestine, and Transjordan. Of these, we listed 997 villages in the area of Palestine. They were divided into Lua, which is a district, Nahia, which is a sub-district, and villages. For each village, we have an estimate of the village population, their milla, that means their religion, what crops and plants they grow, and what tax they owed, and on this basis, we created this map. It is a remarkable record. We could identify the same names of modern Palestine with slight phonetic Turkish accented variations. But the vast Muslim state, which extended to most of the known world, came under a new threat. Europe returned to the Arab East after 700 years since the Crusades. This era was ushered by Napoleon's campaign in Egypt in 1798. Napoleon, whom you see here, came to discover the world of Islam. Even he declared himself as an imam, and also to discover his way to India in competition with the British. But three years before his campaign, Count Volney, a Frenchman, traveled to Syria and Egypt and wrote a detailed book on the situation there, a kind of intelligence report, as we call them today. And this report of this book was obligatory reading for Napoleon's officers. Although Napoleon's campaign lasted only three years, it had a profound effect on the Arab East. He had with him 79 scholars who produced the famous La Description de l'Egypte, in 18 volumes. One achievement stands out. A young surveyor by the name of Colonel Pierre Jacoutin produced the first scientifically charted maps of Palestine, especially its east coast. A flurry of activity followed. Travelers, priests, officers, surveyors, spies, and artists descended upon Palestine, Syria, and Egypt. They drawing the landscape here, for example, Ramla, Jaffa, and Gaza. They wrote books. They charted maps. In particular, the Germans were very active cartographers of Palestine. The maps by Van de Velde and Kiepert were very well known. Here is one map named Palestina, dated 1864. 
It had the names of Palestinian towns and villages, but with crusaders' names underneath. The French came back. The French scholar Victor Gourin visited Palestine in about 1860s, and he wrote seven volumes about Palestinian villages, and he created maps for them. If all these works were nostalgic memoirs of the Orient, or reminiscences of the Crusaders, they were the embers of a new colonial movement of another kind, which brought death and destruction to Palestine in the 20th century. Here, a word of explanation about this movement is necessary. The movement started in Russia, but it, it was encouraged at one time by Napoleon. Basically, it was fed, raised, and developed by England. In the age of emancipation, equal national citizenship rights for every citizen were affirmed. European Jews faced a dilemma. Russian Jews in particular, escaping the Russian pogroms, wanted to immigrate to Western Europe and the United States of America. But a small number of Jews wanted to keep the ghetto bond and build a bigger ghetto, they called it a nation, for them another a place other than their home countries. Support for this desire came from the Restoration Movement, which is known today as Christian Evangelists, a Zionist movement which wanted to ship European Jews to Palestine disguised as a call to repatriate them to their ancestral home. Lord Palmerston, a dominant figure in British policy, foreign policy, in the mid-19th century, championed this initiative. He envisioned Jews as an advanced Western post to break the Ottoman Empire and serve British interests. Seventy-five years later, Balfour formulated this same plan in his infamous Balfour Declaration. But these religious ideas bonded well with British colonial interests. It needed direct action. Hence, the Palestine Exploration Fund, PF, under the patronage of Queen Victoria, was established in 1865. The ostensible aim was the geographical study of the Bible, but in real terms it had clear military objectives, that is, seizing the Arab East from the hands of the Ottoman Empire. And this project, as it developed, was named the Survey of Western Palestine. It was the most detailed study of Palestine since the First World War. Although the survey was organized by PEF, a scholarly society, it was directed and financed by the British War Office and was carried out by British Army officers and it was financed by the War Office, as I said. These maps were instrumental in later years in Olympia's campaign to conquer Palestine in 1917. The product of this valuable survey was 26 maps and 12 volumes about Palestine's topography, archaeology, fauna and flora, and special volumes about Jerusalem. Because of the immense importance of this survey, we spent two decades and even more studying the original documents of the survey as they came from Palestine. We retrieved them, we retrieved them by contract with BF, the original four uh, field reports and maps. We made considerable corrections to the names and places in Arabic and English. We added new data not published before, and we found 4,000 new names over the reported 9,000 names. This work 
is now published as the Atlas of Palestine, 1871 to 1877, in 600 large pages. This is the Atlas of Arab Palestine. There was not a single Jewish colony in Arab Palestine. We have 13,000 Palestinian Arab names to prove it. Palestine, obviously, was not an empty land. Here in this map, you can see the area covered from Litani River in the north to Wadi Gaza in the south. The brown color is in the area of Lebanon today. The blue is in Palestine. Here you see one trace as produced in Palestine by the surveyors. It's about Akka, Acre. It's a very detailed one. Here is now a map of the original survey overloaded by our work. We have added terrain, we have added colors, we have added corrected names, we have added names in Arabic and English, and so on. These two examples are from the pages of the new atlas. As you read through the pages of the British survey, you cannot help notice the spirit of the Crusades permeated the whole survey. The opening page of the first memoir was adorned with the image of a crusade, a crusade soldier, here it is. It was not only an image. The PF memoirs are full of details about crusades ruins, dates, names, description of derelict places, and so on. It seems that their search was chasing the trail of the crusaders' failed attempt to conquer Palestine. It was an attempt to revive dead objects and dead memories. If there was any doubt about the purpose of the survey, the PAF president, the Archbishop of York, William Thompson, clarified the matter in his inaugural speech to the foundation. He said, The country of Palestine belongs to you and to me. It is essentially ours. It is the land to which we may look upon with the true patriotism as we do to this dear old England which we love so much. That was what he said. This was hardly different from the speech given by Pope Urban II 800 years earlier in year 1095, exhorting the quarreling laws of Europe to wage the Crusaders' war in Palestine. He said, Set out on the road to the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. Take the land from that wicked people and make it your own. I ask, who were those wicked people? They were the people of the land, the Palestinians. The survey made a thorough research of dead objects, but it failed to mention anything worthy about the living people who lived in 2,000 human settlements, people who crafted 13,000 names of their country. Well, it's clear by now that the survey was a prelude to colonization of Palestine. The British invaded Palestine in the spring of 1917. They failed twice to take Gaza, although they bombed it with poison gas canisters, as this photograph shows. Then they tried another route. I have a personal connection to this story. The British took a diversion away from Gaza, starting from my own land, al Ma'in Abu Sitta, and they marched all night through the Wadi, they attacked Beersheba unexpectedly in the next day, and they took it on the night of 31st October 1917. 48 hours later, Balfour issued his infamous declaration from London. But two months later, precisely 
on 9th of December 1917, LMB victoriously entered Palestine on foot. As I said, that was two months after the infamous Balfour Declaration, but it was 730 years to the day after Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi liberated Jerusalem from the hands of the Crusaders. With this long history of Palestine, it really boggles the mind how the West accepted the myth that Palestine is a land without people. After all the expense, extensive surveys by the British, the French, and the Germans, how can they accept the Zionist claim that Palestine was empty? Look at this shameful travesty. The Zionist Commission submitted this map to the 1919 Versailles Peace Conference. They called Palestine an empty land, a grazing land, with roaming shepherds who took their sheep and went away. With this kind of map, the League of Nations adopted Balfour Declaration and gave Britain the mandate over Palestine to establish national home for the Jews. When the Zionist Herbert Samuel, the first British High Commissioner, entered Palestine in July 1920, he found a different Palestine, a rich, fertile country. It has or it had a variety of seasons and variety of terrains, coasts, mountain, and valley. In our atlas, Atlas of Palestine 1917 to 1966, we have recorded all details of Palestine to a minute detail during the mandate, during the Annakba, and after. This is Palestine with fertile land, fertile land. It has in particular 2,100 wells, 32 cisterns, 1,700 springs, and 75 water tanks and 424 water towers. This is Palestine which the British found. There were also 1,113,000 villages in Palestine. But under the British, 185 Jewish colonies were planted. Where were they planted? Let us look back at PF survey at the end of the 19th century. The black dots on the map are villages shown on the British survey. You can see how densely populated Palestine was, especially in the hilly areas and in the north. But there were widely spaced villages on the sandy dunes, dunes on the coast. The Zionists had these maps, and that's where they planted colonies under British rule. Marj ibn Amr was another Zionist colony in the land shamefully sold by Sursuk family. All these colonies were the staging points for the Haganah to conquer Palestine. In 1948, 120,000 Zionist militia in nine brigades in 31 military operations conquered 78% of Palestine. You can see here the areas conquered at each time interval. The columns show the number of refugees expelled and number of villages depopulated. Two-thirds of Palestinian people were expelled from 675 cities and villages. This great tragedy could not have happened without massacres. We recorded 156 massacres and atrocities in this period. Here is one victim of these atrocities. Burer Map it was surrounded from three sides and a massacre was committed 
in which 120 people were killed in their own homes. Here is another in Tantura, where people were ordered to dig trenches, and they were thrown in these trenches and shot. And here, there are civilian captives in Ramla in July 1948. All the survivors were taken to concentration camps and forced labor camps. We recorded 17 forced labor camps. Of those, five were reported by the Red Cross. We examined the pattern of these massacres, their date, the region in which they occurred, the location, the Israeli brigade who committed these crimes, and their correlation with the expulsion of the inhabitants. Here is the pattern of massacres in the north of Palestine. You can see these blue dots are the location of massacres. And then here are the depopulated villages. As a result, you can see the depopulation was closely correlated with the massacres committed. So the conclusion is damning. Massacres were a weapon of ethnic cleansing. All these war crimes you have seen occurred before 15 May, that is before Israel was declared as a state, under the nose of the British and before any Arab regular soldier entered Palestine. This is the true Zionist invasion of Palestine. When Palestine was emptied of its people, a whole new campaign of rooting, plunder, and construction, uh, destruction followed. In a mass frenzy, new Jewish settlers, who just came from Europe from a smuggler ship, looted and plundered 500,000 houses, businesses, offices, banks, and companies. Then the actual destruction started for the purpose of not allowing the refugees to return. Here, the old quarter of Tiberias, 3,500 years old, as shown in yellow, was destroyed. So were also all parts of Jaffa and Haifa. But the most dramatic, dramatic is the destruction of villages in which Jesus Christ walked and lived, as they immortalized, immortalized by Eusebius in the year 313. This is a great crime against human heritage. As you see in the map, all these red dots are villages destroyed. This is a crime against everything sacred to civilized human beings. The destruction was systematic, planned, and carefully executed over a long period without any military necessity. Palestine now became empty. We ask who took over their land. Two parties took over the land. The new provisional government of Israel and the Jewish National Fund. The Jewish National Fund is an international Jewish organization registered in 53 countries as charity, as charity, to serve the environment. In 19 50. It immediately seized the land of 372 villages and they planted 120 parts on them to hide the debris of the destroyed house. Now, Palestinians became refugees. What is the name of this tragedy? It's called an Nakba. Here you see, before they were depopulated, and then how they are depopulated, Palestine became empty, and then where they became refugees in these refugee camps in the rest of Palestine and in neighboring Arab countries. We recorded the aftermath of an Nakba fully. What happened to these villages? Who lives in them today? Which organization or colonization company took over the land. What are the remaining features of the villages? This is our atlas called 
the return journey atlas. It is not possible in this short talk to review the long history of Palestine, but instead I highlighted some major stations since the time of Jesus Christ till the painful times in which we live today. This short review is enough to show us the rich and recorded history of Palestine. It's a wonderful, astonishing record. It's much more than a general map of the country as a whole. It is a record of even the smallest villages, possibly villages of 500 people in olden times, where people lived peacefully for centuries until the Zionist invasion destroyed their life. Here is an example of one small village called Ma'lul. Here is Ma'lul today, it's destroyed. And then Ma'lul in 1948, we have detailed plans of the village. And then Ma'lul in the 19th century. And then Ma'lul uh, in the early Ottoman period, 1596. And Ma'lul as seen and known by Bishop Eusebius. It was called Na'alul. This record of history is unparalleled anywhere. So, the next question to ask, when we have these records, what shall we do with them? The answer is clear. Restoring Palestine. Restoring Palestine is a sacred duty. It's legal by all articles of international law. And it is doable. I shall illustrate that. First, we have to chart the elements of future Palestine. What does it look like? These elements of future Palestine are the people of the land, the land itself, and the applicable law. The land and the law are sufficiently documented. It's the people and the population whom we need to examine carefully. They consist of the remaining Palestinians in Israel and the refugees who have the right to return in addition, there is the existing settler Jewish population. Palestinians today are 13 million. Half of them are on Palestine soil, and they are now similar number to the Jews there, and two-thirds of Palestinians are refugees. Now, people ask me, what shall we do with that? The answer clearly is that the international law is in the side of the right of return. So, if this is the case, why couldn't we return? Is it physically difficult or impossible? The Europeans tell me, how can you do that without creating a Jewish Nakba? This is an immoral and perhaps a racist question. If burglars shoot their way into your house and kills your father and throw your mother out of their house, then this and then brings his cousins into your house. Should you give him your house and you remain a refugee? The answer is clearly no. But nevertheless, I'm going to show how this question is unnecessary. Here in this map, we show our analysis of the village lands today. The green areas show the village lands which have at the moment no Jews at all or very few Jews, less than 5,000. The blue areas show where the Jews live today. They are roughly the same uh, like they were living during the British mandate. Then we have the area occupied by cities in the brown area. We have also added the dotted areas in which Jews today overcrowded in village lands of Palestinians. So you can see it's quite feasible uh, for the return. The accumulation and concentration of Jews today in these blue circles is concentrated around Tel Aviv, West Jerusalem and Jaffa. And therefore, there is no reason why the Palestinians shown in red dots 
cannot return home. If now we repopulate Palestinian villages, um, then the next question is how we can deal with this situation today. Since it is very clear there is no logistic reason, no legal reason, no demographic reason, no geographical reason why the Palestinians could not return, the answer is there is only one obstacle, that is the Zionist racist policies and apartheid, which must be demolished. This analysis which I gave you, that village lands of Palestinians are still empty today, seem to be strange to some. The Israelis vehemently denied that this is the case. But actually they don't tell you they have made a study in 1995 proving just that. Here is a map based on the Israeli study. This table shows that 88% of Palestine, of Israel today, is taken over by the army and by weapons of mass destruction. It is not a habitable place for the people. Since now it is possible to implement the return of the refugees without major displacement of the uh, present occupants, then we should actually start thinking of sending them back to their villages. The first thing we have to do is to identify the villages. Here is one, Kula village in Ramla. Kula village, we have lots of records about it. Here is maps about Kula from 1948 in different scales, 250,000, 100,000, 20,000. And then after 1948, it remains intact until 1955, 1960, but then it was destroyed, destroyed. Next question is, where are the refugees from Kula? They are mostly in Jordan, and we know in which camp they are now, and we know their route of return to their village when this is possible. But there is a human side. Let us pick a family called Qalawla from Kula. This family, they lived now in Muzdar camp in Jordan. The grandfather tells his children about their home in Kula. So this is the virtual return route of Qalawla family to the map. And here is the aerial photo of their village. They will find their house destroyed. But the granddaughter, Arwa, is graduating as a young architect. She participated in our annual competition for the reconstruction of destroyed villages and got a prize. Her first job was to rebuild her family house in Kula and reconstruct the whole village. And that's what you see now. This is her work. We repeated the same for many other villages and will continue to that every year. The cost of repatriation and reconstruction can be estimated from this map or table. Actually, it's very manageable. It's very small. We need from one and a half million dwelling units to two million which is smaller than many projects in the Gulf today. And this reconstruction can be done purely by Palestinian engineers and labor. It is worth noting that the cost of construction is a small fraction of the USA to Israel. Moreover, it is, can be incurred, can be incurred only once, not annually, as the case of aid to Israel. UNRWA, with its predominantly Palestinian staff, should be able to supervise the repatriation. It takes from five to seven years. The only condition, the only condition for this plan to succeed, it's a non-negotiable condition, a compulsory condition, that is, occupation, racism, apartheid, or discrimination of 
or any such ideology or practice must be totally abolished. This conclusion is final. So now here we are. We charted some stations on the historical record of Palestine in 2000 years. Few European capitals today can match this record. Yet Palestine was described as a land without people by those same people who charted and studied every corner of it. Their aim was clear, to declare that Palestine is empty and its people are natives, meaning unworthy, unimportant, and they should be wiped out, either physically or politically and culturally. Israel committed the historical crime of a Nakba. Palestinians have not seen anything like that. But to achieve that and keep it till today, the Zionists had to wage ten kinds of different wars against the Palestinians. Military wars, historical, geographical, archaeological, religious, political, legal, economic, defamation and deception campaigns. No colonial power in history has to wage so many different wars on a defenseless people. But they did not succeed, at least not fully. Palestinians today are 13 million people. Half of them are on Palestinian soil. They plan for the future in their homeland. Palestine. They have not forgotten. They have not surrendered. They have not given up. Palestine will rise from the ashes and this child will return home. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Salman Abu Sitta, for a fantastic lecture and intervention and um, um, outlook uh, that remains really linked with the land and aims to reclaim it through all kinds of tools, the writing of history, the activation of its memory, the inspiration of young people reconnecting them to the land through your writing competitions and lectures of this nature. Um, I am sure the audience would like to um, ask you questions, if we may take questions. Uh, if you'd like to do that, I will open the floor for our um, wonderful audience who've been here. Um, I wrote in the chat, Can if you have a question, please um, either type it up in the chat or raise your hand and I will give you the floor and unmute you. So I'll start with... Um, uh, Zain Sharap, whose hand has been up for a while. Uh, let me see. If I can unmute you. Okay, Mr. Rafik Kobersi. Yeah. Uh, yes, sure. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Mnawar. Uh, yeah, it's Alan, a pleasure Alan. to listen to you. This is not a lecture, this is a documentary. I'm, I'm so uh, pleased to uh, have the chance, and thank you, Dr. Hawaida, uh, for inviting me. Uh, as you know, Dr. Uh, Sami Haddawi and I, we uh, gathered a lot of documents from the village statistics. And I have these original things, uh, you know, Dr. Uh, uh, Sami uh, passed away a few years, and I would be more than happy on my next visit to bring all these original documents uh, to add to your uh, holdings of these things. Thank you, that would be fantastic. Uh, it, it, it would be a pleasure, and hopefully we could make some contribution too, okay? I mean, this is an excellent... Uh, initiative and it's a part of our collective memory so that our rights are not trampled upon again and erased from the face of history we uh, 
this is part of our struggle to reassert our rights and our existence. Thank you very much. And uh, please, anytime you have a lecture or anything, and if when I come to Beirut, I will be more than happy one time to come and talk about what we've done and how we documented the economy in 1940s. And that uh, this myth that uh, Palestine was an empty land, it was a thriving economy, actually a, a middle country at that time and had all the capacities uh, to uh, advance to a really advanced economy that was slaughtered and dismembered. Thank you. Um, Dr. Abusitta, you wanted to comment? Can, can you have? Yes, of course. Uh, good morning, Dr. Atif Qubrusi. Dr. Atif uh -huh. is a good friend of mine. I would say, without talking about our ages, almost 50 years ago, we were together in so many societies in I Canada. Was not, I was not born then. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I, I recall with great uh, pride the work you have done with, uh, with um, Sami Hadawi in the book called The Rights and Losses of Palestine. It yeah. is a record of the Palestinian ownership uh, in um, Palestine after Nakba, uh, based on uh, Jarl's report, which is the United Nations Consolidation Commission of Palestine, right. uh, which they published in 1964. It's a very valuable record, and Dr. Atif made a very critical economic uh, comments on that, the meaning of that. Um, so um, for those researchers who are interested, they should never miss to read the book by Dr. Sami Hadawi and Dr. Atif Qobrosi, Rights and Losses of Palestine. Thank nice you. to hear your voice, Dr. Atif. Hey, nice to see you too. Thank you. Thank you both. I have a number of questions. I'll start with the one straightforward. Uh, were the maps developed in the GIS, Dr. Abu Sitta? Of course. Uh, oh, oh. I don't follow. All our maps are in GIS. And yes. uh, for those interested, we are creating a database for all villages online uh, from this time, fourth century till now. You can look up uh, villages and these uh, uh, periods, which I mentioned before, and especially about an Nakba. Um, and this is already uh, part of it is published in the website of our society, Palestine Land Society, www.plands.org. And very soon they will be available under the directorship of Dr. Huida Al Harithi in AUB in the PLSC Center. So if you don't find me, I think Dr. Huida will be the best. Uh, um, caretaker and uh, and uh, holder of, of, of these tokens. Thank you. Um, uh, there is a question from Livia Wick. I'll unmute you, Livia. Tfaddali. Uh, good evening, Dr. Abu Sitta. It's, a, it's an honor to have you uh, speak at AUB. I wanted, I would love to hear about uh, your personal journey to uh, studying land and maps and then constructing an archive. Yes. Uh, thank you, Livia. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, at the risk of repeating myself, this is a long journey. I started when I was a young man a long time ago doing my PhD at University College London and as a, yeah, in 1960. And uh, as a young man who was suddenly a refugee, I found myself in London, England, the home of the British Mandate, and I tried to find maps about Palestine. They told me there is no Palestine. I went to Royal Geographical Society, British Archives and all that. I could not find maps about Palestine. And I said, it's impossible. You just left Palestine in chaos, in great uh, state of tragedy. How come you don't have Palestine? And I pointed to a map. I said, this is Palestine. I said, ah, you mean Israel. And I found that all the records are written and listed under the name Israel. So I started the journey 
collecting documents, not only from England. Uh, people think that there is one big house in England where you have these, there are at least 15 to 20 uh, organizations in England which have documents about Palestine. But then I went to Paris and also uh, Napoleon and uh, British, uh, sorry, French um, uh, colonization of Syria and so on. There are documents and in Munich, Germany, they have the First World War, um, uh, War Museum, they call it. They have the first aerial photos of Palestine and of course in Istanbul, Daftari Mufassal uh, covered the period from 1517 to 1917. And of course, the uh, um, uh, in the Vatican, uh, the documents about Palestine in the Byzantine period. So, uh, because of people who coveted the land of Palestine, they recorded it. And we have, by way of uh, uh, twist in history, we have full documentation of Palestine. Um, and, well, the result is several atlases we produced and about 300 papers talking about that. Okay, um, I'll read a couple of questions that I think are related, Dr. Abu Sitta. Uh, one that says, why has there been any uh, high profile case, uh, legal or legal efforts of Palestinians claiming their property rights in Palestine that were occupied and taken in 1948? Why have there been no challenges in the international courts of the so-called absent absentee property owner laws, question mark. A very related question um, says, um, uh, thanks for, well, it's, I'll, I'll stay with this one for now. I'll come back to the second one. Right. Well, this is a very important question to ask. Um, the Palestinians and the Arabs in general, their aim from 1948 was to recover the land of Palestine and return the refugees to their homes. If they do that, then the problem is solved. The people will go back to their, uh, to their land and their homes. As I said, they are very well documented. Um, but the question you ask comes if people dropped the idea of liberation and went to the uh, international law to seek um, restitution. They call it restitution of property. If they do that, it is quite possible um, in terms of international law. I'm not sure how possible it is if uh, the United States have a veto against it, but it is very well uh, um, placed and examined. I'll explain why. No Israeli Jew today has a title deed of any Palestinian property, not one. There are probably a few exceptions. All the Palestinian land is run by something called Israel Land Administration in custody, in custody. And they rent our land to the kibbutz and other places for um, a, a lease of 49 years and they make it 99. So actually, when we recover our property, we don't have to go to each Israeli and say, give me back my land or my home. We have one single document which is transferring our land um, to the people who owns it. And uh, let me emphasize this once more. The United Nations agrees with that. Every year there is a resolution in the United Nations called Refugees Revenue. It calls on Israel to, co to collect and record all the money, all the rental they have collected from Palestinian refugee and keep it in a custody account for Palestinians. What is missing from this equation is the enforcement of international law and removal of Western, especially US opposition to it. Okay, um, another knows. question asks, um, uh, why was the city of Nazareth, my hometown, where we still own and live in our original home, not ethnically cleansed in 1947-48? This, this is a well-established uh, historical story 
um, Ben Gurion ordered all his commanders to evacuate all Palestinian villages. Um, the officer in charge of Nazare is called Denkelman. He's Canadian. He refused to do that. He said, this is a place where the Western Christianity looks upon and it will be bad for us to do that. He refused the Gurion order. And he actually, therefore, did not evacuate the people. Um, in Gurion, it is uh, said that he agreed with that, but in retrospect, he did that in retrospect without, without really planning it originally. Uh, and uh, by the way, uh, as a result of that, the villages nearby Nazareth, like Ma'lul, Safuria, uh, they took refuge in, uh, in Nazareth, and they, um, therefore, uh, they were safe temporarily. Although uh, there were massacres in Ilut, next to Nazareth, and uh, uh, Ailabun as well. So it is aberration of history contrary to the Zionist uh, plan. Okay, thank you again. Uh, can you take a couple more questions, Dr. Abusita? Uh, I'll be glad to, if I can. Okay. All right, there is a question. Is the planning and design outcome of each village being communicated to all the expelled villagers for them to keep track of their actual virtual village? Question mark. Uh, that's a statement, is that a question? It's a, it's a question, I think, um, about uh, planning and design for the villages that you talked about, the demolished villages. Uh, yes, we, we have an communicated idea. to those expelled from these villages. Uh, I, I didn't follow. Um, you mean uh, rebuilding of the destroyed villages? Yes. Yes. Well, we started for five years ago, uh, as you well know, uh, Professor, um, uh, annual competition uh, among young Palestinian architects in about 10 Palestinian and Arab universities. We tell them your graduation project will not be Siberia or France. It will be one village in Palestine, which you uh, should reconstruct. So we give them each year a different list of villages. They choose one. We give them data we have about the village, aerial photos, you know, number of population, uh, what they did and so on the history and geography of the village. And we also tell them the population now of the village is 10 times what it was before. And these are the um, terms of reference for you to redesign it. And they do. And we have international jury from Britain, Germany, and Ireland. The best design. Each year, we, uh, they select the top three designs. By the way, tomorrow I have a Zoom uh, 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 with those young people uh, designing the village of Brer, north of Gaza, we gather the people of Brer from the refugee camps and oh. tell them, look, look how these young people designed your villages. And we hear their comments and uh, they say, this is where my place is. The young people of that village, they say, this is my heritage. And a very moving experience that they talk with these young people who never saw the village, but they designed it very well in modern times. Okay. Um, what, yes, and I really have to salute that competition and its outcomes and the, the, the engagement of the younger population and students in this. It's fabulous, and I've been uh, lucky to be involved a little bit. I think I will close with a forward-looking uh, question that asks, you, where do you see future studies needing to go? There are many pointers for that. First of all, the Palestinians are now 13 million people. In 2030, their population will be around 18 million people. Half of those 9 million are already on Palestine soil. They will not go away. They will not give up their land. They will not accept to be marginalized. Of course, they could be under occupation, they could be under apartheid, they could be under racism. 
they could be under bombardment, but they have survived this so far 72 years and they will continue to do that. The biggest problem for Israel is not really for us, it is for Israel because they can never absorb or um, get rid of these Palestinians. That's one thing. The other thing is, from the world perspective, I travel and speak about Palestine in universities in Europe and America and even Japan. I am struck by the response of young people, young people everywhere, including young American Jews, that they abhor injustice and they are against what is happening to Palestinians. Why? Because now with the new uh, information technology, they can know all the facts. The Zionism had uh, cast a blanket of darkness about the truth in Palestine. This blanket is slowly lifting. As you can see, uh, BDS is gaining ground. In America, there's something called SJP, Student for Justice in Palestine. In England, there is BDS, uh, sorry, there is uh, S -S, uh, uh, campaign, uh, Palestine Solidarity Campaign. I know these are popular moves and they have not reached the echelons yet of the governments of the West. They're still against us. They are still colonial as they were in the First World War. But if we persist, if we continue, we will win. Because on the opposite side, there is no future for such injustice to remain. Okay, I think this brings us to the um, end, although I think no one wants to leave. <laughs> the chat is uh, active. Uh, but uh, I'm, I'm super grateful. I'm really sad we ran out of time. But I'm telling people on the chat, Dr. Abbas, this is only the beginning. There'll be many, many talks and interactions and webinars and hopefully in-person meetings uh, with you and other spe speakers and researchers in our Palestine Land Study Center at EUB. So this is the beginning and hopefully we'll meet many, many more times and uh, all our guests will, will hopefully return to engage with us. Let me, Dr. Hoeda, make an advertisement for PLSC. Under your directorship, we already have 25 research projects, all kinds of every discipline, in geography, in history, in population, in politics, in military studies, in historical studies. So, I hope we encourage all young people to come to you, do their research, do their PhD with you, um, even come for scholarship uh, visits, um, sabbaticals and all. They will find um, a very wide field of research supported by 10,000 items of archives which should be in your possession. So there is no excuse for anyone who wants to study Palestine even if they are not Palestinian. If they seek justice and they seek truth, here it is, go to Huayda at AUB. <laughs> yes, and they're now requesting a, a lecture in Arabic. So I said, yes, we can do that, of course. Uh, Absolutely. So Absolutely. I want to, Absolutely. to end really by thanking all our uh, wonderful guests and attendees who joined us for this very special moment for us. And I want to thank uh, Dr. Salman Abu Sitta for always uh, being generous and supportive and uh, for helping AUB make this wonderful, wonderful historic step of establishing the center due his, to his generous collection and support. Thank you so much. Thank it's you. been a real pleasure. Thank you for your time and for your intellectual engagement. Thank you, everybody. And until we see you again, take really good care, stay safe. Thank you, Dr. Salman. Thanks. 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 Bye bye. Yeah.